Hello and welcome. I'm Kurt Conklin, Instructional Specialist in the Department of Public Health at Montclair State University. We're so excited to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of our accredited Master of Public Health degree program. Today we'll be speaking with five MSU alumni who earned their MPH in this program and can show us how they've used their education in public health to make a difference in New Jersey and beyond. Joining us later will be Sarah Bonilla, Arirotun Osho, and Monica Hanna. But first I'd like to introduce Chris Helwig from our class of 2011 and Kim Mandarano, who graduated earlier this year. Chris is the public health officer for the town of Irvington and Kim is an inside sales consultant in women's health care at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. I want to start our conversation with a general question before we turn to your specific experiences in public health. Many people in the United States don't really know what public health is. Um, what is one example you would give to help someone understand how public health affects their life? Most people don't think about public health until something happens or it affects their lives some way. And one easy example that I like to give, especially with governmental public health, is restaurant inspections. Most people uh, at some point throughout the year, throughout the month, will stop at a retail food establishment, whether that's a fast food restaurant, a date night at a restaurant or their local um, pub or bar, you know, it's up to us as the local health authority to inspect those restaurants and food establishments, make sure that they're following all applicable laws and to make sure that um, the restaurant patrons can really be assured that they have um, the greatest dining experience and healthiest dining experience that they can. Mm -hmm. So that's a great uh, example of restaurant inspections and it's e I think it's easy for the public to understand that. Kim, what's an example you would give to help people understand what is public health? Sure, so to Chris's point, public health is all around us and I don't think people realize that until it affects them personally, it is public health, right? So earlier this week, I was talking to one of my coworkers and he's on a new diet and he actually noticed that once he started, you know, making healthier choices in terms of salads or vegetables and organic aside, you know, if you weigh that salad at the bar versus go and get a $2 burger at McDonald's, um, it's more expensive, you know, more costly to eat healthier sometimes. So when I said that to him, I said, you know, that's public health and that's how obesity is happening. He was like, you know what, you're right. It is a public health issue. So we never thought about it that way. Making the connection between systemic things and then personal behaviors, right, right. is a key thing in public health. Um, I'd like to turn to your specific work in public health and ask you a few particular questions. Um, Chris, as a public health officer for a local government, you see how disease outbreaks and other local emergencies require municipal action. Well, what's an example of how you've had to convince Irvington residents that government is taking action to protect their health and safety? Yeah, so that's a, it's a great question. And one thing that comes to my mind immediately is today, um, as we're speaking, we have our communicable disease specialists uh, in the department that are going out to visiting local schools within our township to do immunization audits. So what it is our responsibility is to work with the schools to make sure that all students at those schools have the immunization that is required here in the state of New Jersey, or if the students are unable to or have a religious exemption, that they have documentation of that. And it's really just a double check on our end to make sure that everyone is following the rules um, or, you know, and making to make sure that the general public is safe and we don't have an outbreak. If uh, people respond with resistance or confusion, is there anything that you typically say to help clarify for them what that is? Yeah, well, we do a lot of um, education both with and training both with uh, the staff at the school. So we work closely with the school nurses and the school administration to make sure that they're well aware of what you know the importance of, is of immunization. And also we do regular uh, communication with the parents as well, whether that's through workshops, um, you know, peer um, learning, make word of mouth, sharing the importance of immunization and why it is part of a healthy um, part of growing up. But we do understand that it is every parent's prerogative to make the best decision for their child. And if that um, is with medical exemption or with religious exemption, that they follow the rules that are required for that. And that way all documentation is, is there. And we know um, if there is an outbreak or if somebody does get sick, we know which children um, that we need to, um, you know, contact to make sure that they're not exposed. Sure. Thanks. Kim, uh, you work in the private sector for a pharmaceutical company that develops drugs to treat medical problems and specifically those affecting women. The, the public is often critical of what they call big pharma, 
But these companies play a big role in uh, advancing solutions to public health problems. What's an example of this that you've witnessed in your own work? Yeah, absolutely. So I am in sales. So of course, people are going to, you know, phase as you're, you know, pushing drugs and you're doing it for your own selfish, you know, for the company. For but motive, right. exactly, right? But um, if you look at the bigger picture, right, I'm promoting contraception in the form of IUDs. So unintended pregnancy is a big public health issue, right? So if you look at the entire picture, I'm promoting these products to make sure that, I talk to OBGYNs all the time, so to make sure that doctors, nurses, you know, they have access to these IUDs to get on their shelves, so that way when patients come in, they have access, um, they have options, and just to reduce unintended pregnancy overall. Um, a lot of providers that I talk to will tell me, you know, they might have a population of high Medicaid, or low income and they don't always have access or coverage. So, you know, my part of my job is to help the providers get that in the office and help these patients in the long run. I have a few general questions I'd like to put to both of you. Uh, for starters, how does public health reflect your personal beliefs and values? Could we start with Chris? Yeah. So I, it's something that has always interested me. You know, you know it's a little bit everyone, because I did my undergrad in animal science. So everyone's like, well, how did you go from animals to people? And, you know, there's a huge, you know, impact of animal health is also human health. And I've just always enjoyed kind of really the more population health aspect of it, of that we're all interconnected and that it really does take, you know, you know, a whole, like a village almost really to make sure that we are, you know, being, and everyone has the ability to live the healthiest life that they want to and that they, that they wish to. And that's really where I think public health is able to um, give people the tools to live those lives that they want to live. How about for you, your personal beliefs and values? How yeah. does public health reflect that? Yeah, absolutely. So as a woman too, you know, um, I am. I feel like women should have the ability to choose in terms of not only contraception, but women's health care, reproductive rights. Um, you should have the ability to go to a family planning clinic, to go and get information and help for you know, reproductive health, sexual health. So for me personally, as a woman, I am fighting for reproductive health and women's health care, so. Great, thank you. Um, most people do not intuitively understand that uh, housing is public health, jobs are public health, uh, well-funded and well-supported K through 12 public education and public higher education are also public health. We know these examples as what we call the social determinants of health. But how do you help people understand this in relation to your own work? Chris? Yeah, so that's great. So one of the things that is huge that we work with here uh, where I, in, in Irvington where I work is, let's say, is lead. And lead-based paint is a, is a big burden uh, throughout all of New Jersey, not just in our urban centers, but really throughout the entire state. New Jersey is a very old state and our housing stock is very old. So it's really important for all residents to understand that Lead can st is still a hazard that is out there, even though lead-based paint has not been commercially available for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still in a lot of people's houses, especially if you live in a house that was built before 1978. Um, and as that paint deteriorates, it creates a dust, which is what is the vast majority of children who have elevated blood lead levels, is that's how they're getting exposed. That's a good point. I'm familiar with the, with the actually uh, myth that uh, children are peeling paint chips off the walls. That's yeah. really not the way it works. Right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's something that happens, but the vast majority of the time, it's really about you know dust and really we want folks to have a healthy home and do active cleaning and making sure that dust is removed from the home because that's really where the vast majority of cases are being and children are being exposed from. Yeah. Um, and how about for you? How do you uh, explain those social determinants of health to people? Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said before, I do talk to a lot of OBGYNs and um, women's health care providers all over the nation as well. And places, I don't think people realize that different states have different populations, right? So you might have low income, uninsured. Um, so, you know, like southern Texas, let's say, or Missouri, there's rural health and a lot of people who don't have access to contraception or women's health care. So, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, I'll just go to the doctor and, you know, get some women's health care things. But, you know, when it comes to populations and you don't think about maybe they don't have access to get to the clinic, maybe they mm -hmm. don't have insurance, you know, mm -hmm. it's little things like that that add up. I see. Um, now I want to turn to uh, people who work within the U.S. healthcare system because many of them also struggle with what is public health. Uh, some people who work in the U.S. healthcare system do not see public health as a science. 
uh, because they don't think public health requires technical skills like those of a surgeon or a data analyst or a nurse. How do you show these healthcare system stakeholders that public health really is science? Chris? Yeah, so that's a good, and I think, you know, it's kind of a myth that public health isn't science. I mean, it's, you know, it's our job to really understand what, you know, the technical details of um, whether it's medical, healthcare data, and take that and interpret it to the public so that they, or even to other doctors, um, and really take that information and, and place it in a way that other people can understand it. And that really takes a deep understanding of what the issues are, and whether that is within your local community, at a larger level, state level, regional level, understanding what the health impacts are and being able to relay that in a way that people can take that information, understand it, and then act upon it. Mm -hmm. And for you, how do you let people know this really is science? Yeah, so absolutely, like Chris was saying, it's not, we might not be medical and we can't you know diagnose something but we're still taking the science and you know using it to pinpoint you know where the source of the problem is coming from for illness or prevention um, another thing i think too is also the healthcare system there's kind of a science and learning what's going on in terms of health policy and healthcare, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people don't understand that mm -hmm. so. Um, so you both trained here at Montclair State University in our master's program. We're so proud to have you as alums. Um, what was the most valuable skill or insight that you learned from studying public health here at Montclair State University? Chris? So I would say, you know, it's, it has been great networking and really being able to broaden the network that I have um, through the cohort that, you know, of my class in, in 2011, and then also just being exposed to the general, you know, greater Essex County area and you know the connections that were made there and then I had a lot of other opportunities here at, at Montclair that I think were great and unique. And Kim what about for you? Yeah so I think learning about actually all the different things that you can do with public health was extremely extremely helpful to learn the program. Also I think again the whole big picture right people don't think about you know issues with water issues with vaccines things like that so to learn about the healthcare system and even socioeconomic status which affects our everyday lives mm -hmm. and everything that was something that I really took away from okay, my job. I'm glad. Stay with us we'll be back with Sarah Bonilla Aredo Tun Osho and Monica Hanna. Welcome back. I'm Kurt Conklin, Instructional Specialist in the Department of Public Health at Montclair State University. Joining me now to celebrate the 10th anniversary of our Master of Public Health program is 2018 graduate Aredo Tunosho, a health and lead inspector and risk assessor for the Plainfield Health Department. Sarah Bonilla, a 2014 graduate, now, with the program, now is the program manager for the Center of Excellence for Latino Health at Clara Maas Medical Center. And Monica Hanna, a 2013 graduate of our program, now working in community education at the RWJ Barnabas Health Institute for Prevention and Recovery. Welcome everyone, glad Thank to have you. you here again. Thank uh, you for having us. We're very excited to have you back on campus to uh, not only for us to catch up with the work you've been doing, but to just learn more about how your public health work has made our community safer, healthier, and more equitable. I wanna start our conversation with a general question before we turn to specific experiences in your own public health work. Uh, many people in the United States don't really know what public health is. Uh, what is one example you would give to help someone understand how public health affects their life? Sarah? Sure, so I mean, public health is literally everything. Uh, one of the examples that I like to use, we, we all like to go out to eat. So the health grades at the restaurants, we're always checking and making sure. So we rely on public health professionals to make sure that our restaurants are clean, that the water is clean. So that's like the main example that I like to use for people to understand. Mm -hmm on a broader perspective what public health Absolutely. is. Absolutely, most people go to restaurants and that's a very easy right. and concrete way to understand <laughs> right. it, right? Yeah. Ade, what's an example that you give to people? Well, like she just said, you know, she wants to make sure our restaurants are safe. I'm one of those guys that go to the restaurant uh -huh. to make sure it's safe. But um, I like to think about public health as um, prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just simply just washing your hands, you 
prevent a lot of diseases from happening. So That's a good point. Many people think hand washing, that's so basic, and yet it's so essential to real public health work, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Monica, what's an example that you give to people to help them understand what is public health? Sure, so I think public health is honestly basic needs. Something as simple as waking up in the morning, turning on your lights, turning on your water, taking a shower, being able to brush your teeth, having access to food, having access to um, electricity, uh, that is public health. And I think when it works, we don't notice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when it's not working, that is when we have an issue and it becomes a public health concern. So um, just basic needs. Makes good sense. Um, I have a few particular questions based on your direct experiences in the public health profession. Um, Sarah, you work on public health problems which especially affect Latino communities in New Jersey. What's an example of a challenge you've had to help people address in their communities, and how has your public health training helped to engage communities in problem solving? Sure, so one of the problems that I first noticed when I came on board at Clara Mass as a program manager for the Center of Excellence for Latino Health is people's access to healthcare in general. So access being language barriers, being absolutely huge. So I've had huge support in the hospital to change signs. That was something that came from the top down and it makes my job very easy as a public health professional when you have everyone on board. Mm -hmm. So changing signs in the hospital and also more educational pieces for outside when we're out in the community. That's a great example of how even healthcare facilities need to think about how effective they are in, right. in delivering public health, right? Um, Ade, uh, as a lead risk assessor in Plainfield, you're well aware of news headlines from Newark and other communities in the United States about elevated lead concentrations uh, in some public water systems and of course lead hazards uh, in old paint and from other environmental sources. What is an example of how you help the public understand these hazards and help them understand what government's role is in addressing those? That's right. So, um, you know, when, when I talk about lead, and I'm very passionate about it, so um, uh, lead is a heavy metal, and, um, you know, when it's in the bloodstream, the blood system, it could cause different adverse health outcomes. So, um, uh, what we try to do as, you know, as a public health organization, especially for Plainfield Health Department, um, is we, we just, it's a, it's a top, down, top down effect. It comes from the federal government with them funding the health departments, you know, it comes from HUD down to New Jersey Department of Health and then to the local public health department. So, you know, we try to go out to homes and try to do an investigation of, okay, what is causing the problem, okay, we now have lead in the bloodstream, how can we determine what is like causing the lead problem? So um, we have doctors that go, um, it's laws that were passed, and because of that we have doctors that, you know, they test the blood, lab, um, blood they do blood screening and we do a lot of screening, and because of that, um, they're able to report into a surveillance system. We have a surveillance system called lead tracks, mm -hmm. and um, in, in the state of New Jersey, at least. And and what what happens is after a doctor, you know, tests a, a child for uh, a test and get um, the level, if it's past a, a threshold, they report it to the state, and the state has a surveillance system that notifies the health department that the lead environmental inspector, like myself, should go out to the homes. And inspect the home, and if we do find lead, um, there's a lot of things in place. We work with, um, we do a lot of collaborative work with um, hospitals. We work with JFK mm -hmm. healthcare system, mm -hmm. and so a child that is lead burden, we have like um, uh, a nurse case manager that goes to um, the home as well as you know the he health inspector. So the health inspector uses the XRF to test the home, and then the nurse case manager tries to find out, okay, what is the diet that, you know, that may help them get rid of the lead in the system, and um, the health inspector, if he does find lead, how he's going to, you know, make sure the lead get abated from, you know, from the top down. So if, with the, um, the crisis going on right now with, um, you know, we, we know about Flint, Michigan, and um, the water crisis, um, most of the time, Lead comes from the leaded pipe because you know, you know, 
pre 1978, lead based paint was at um you know was basically abolished. But like um before that, they were already using leaded pipes, and most homes in New Jersey are built prior to that. So um, those pipes have lead in it, and so most of the time, it's not the water that actually has lead; it's the leaded pipe. So mm -hmm. in the winter time, you know, we have probably less cases of lead than the summertime because they use um, lead solders in the um, in the lead pipe and in the summertime it, it kind of leaches out so that's mm -hmm. how lead gets into the um, the water system to begin with so um, that's basically. So it sounds like you help people connect the dots between right. where the sources of risk are, how they affect adults and children especially, right. and then understanding the role of um, taxes and laws that actually help ensure better public health. That's so that's right. a great example. That's right. Monica, um, you have expertise working with nicotine and tobacco treatment. Vaping has been identified as a national epidemic. Uh, this has contributed to a public health crisis that's, that has unfolded pretty quickly uh, within recent months, although e-cigarettes and vapes have been around for on the market for several years. What do we need to know to better understand how this crisis has played out nationally? Sure. So vaping has been out for several years now and um, over 10 years, and I think it was patented somewhere in 2003 by a Chinese inventor who patented the first nicotine vape, actually. And only in the recent months we've actually seen, or years, I should say, we've recently seen some of the merging issues with um, uh, uh, the respiratory illnesses related directly to vaping, and I think it's becoming a concern, not because, um, you know, all the hospitalizations, I think that's part of it, but I think the additional part of it is that we're reacting very quickly to a lot of issues that we don't know about still. Mm -hmm. um, I think there still needs to be more research. Right now, the CDC is obviously conducting studies and trying to identify what is the actual cause, right? So that takes us back to epidemiology mm -hmm. and being able to really figure out the outbreaks, figure out what's causing these outbreaks, what is the common factor, and how we can actually uh, reduce this and not make it an epidemic here in the U.S. Uh, one of the things, because I work with the NJ Quit Centers with RWJ Institute for Prevention and Recovery, I work with the Nicotine and Tobacco Recovery Program. And within that program, we are tasked to be able to provide free nicotine replacement therapy and free counseling uh, to people who are in need of helping um, with quit, uh, quit services, nicotine services, um, tobacco services, and that includes vaping and e-cigarettes. One of the trends that we're also seeing now is not just an emergence with, um, with vaping products, um, but also dual using as well. Mm. Um, so combining um, vaping products with cigarettes or black and milds or cigars, mm. um, our concern is that nicotine addiction is starting at such a young age now. Uh, so it is a public health crisis in, this, in a way where can, this, can these individuals, can these adolescents become addicted to other substances as they get older? Um, can they, they are, there's research out there now that shows that they're more likely to uh, use cigarettes as they get older and switch. Uh, so being able to really educate people and let them know that the research is still being done. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have almost half a million people that die of tobacco every year. And we're over 2,000 people who have been hospitalized right now from vaping products. Um, could we get to that number at some point and reach half a million? We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but the important part is to make sure that people are aware of what's in them, um, aware of uh, how they're marketed, and without FDA policies and regulations put in place, with cigarettes, people assume that if an FDA policy is put in place for, um, you know, as, as any product that it's deemed safe. That's not true, mm -hmm. right? FDA is, uh, FDA um, regulations are put in place to make sure that the consumer knows what they're buying, um, to release those ingredients to, to the consumers, um, know what you're actually getting. A lot of these vapes that maybe market that they are 0% nicotine, they've actually found that they have nicotine products in them. Um, because there are so many different companies out on the market producing these vapes and producing these products, it's so hard to track um, and so hard to track to see what's actually inside 
fight it. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that regulations are put in place and really knowing your facts, right? Mm -hmm. um, making sure that the research is done. And if you if you don't know the research or if you are a vapor and you, and you need help quitting, you know where to go to get those resources. Mm -hmm. Each of you have given examples that uh, show us in ways that uh, medicine and medical research and medical s clinical service are connected to public health. But mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll agree with me that, on the other hand, medicine alone is not public health, right? right. And the reason I bring this up is the following questions, um, and I'd be interested in hearing your answer, all of you, uh, your answer to this. Some people who work in the U.S. healthcare system do not see public health as a science. Uh, because they don't think public health requires technical skills like those of a surgeon or a data analyst or a nurse. So how do you show these healthcare system stakeholders that public health really is science? Sarah. Sure, so everyone has a stake in public health and knowing to understand that language I think is extremely important that as public health professionals, ideally if we all work together, we all know what we're talking about, but the reality of it is we work with different people from different professions. Mm -hmm. So we need to know how to communicate that in their language. And I think that's part of the skill in the profession that we're all in is we need to learn how to show that person that what we're doing matters and why it matters. If it's their bottom line, if it's financials, if it's more less people coming into the ED for non-emergency cases, these are things that we as public health professionals need to understand mm -hmm. in order to best explain to the person mm. at stake. So. Exactly, and how do you do this, Ade? Yeah, so like, you know, public health, it's science, you know, like most of the time, you know, um, specialists, they focus on individuals, whereas public health focus on the population. Mm -hmm. So because of that, like we're able to find out answers quick. And so if you have one individual that got sick, public health will ask the question, why did they get sick? How did they get sick? You know, it, it, that's where epidemiology comes in and a lot of different branches of science that comes mm -hmm. together. and and you know collaboration so now as a specialist you learn about one thing and one thing only but public health is like the jack of all trades you, know, you learn everything <laughs> so yes. yeah how do you do this monica i agree with what you said um the reason why we do our work is because there's science that's already backing it right mm -hmm. um we don't just do it because we say hey this is a good idea i think we should just run out and do it and sometimes mm -hmm. we do um but <laughs> uh, right so right. i think a lot of the I, a lot of it is um, epidemiology, figuring out um, health outcomes and understanding that. Mm -hmm. um, doing it based off of evidence-based research and making sure that what we're doing is effective. And not to say just because it says it in a journal article, right, it's the same exact way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I know even implementing a program, um, you have different communities, different um, uh, ethnic groups, different populations that you're working with. What worked in one community may not work in another just because it says it in a journal article, but you have the science to back it up and prove it. And you also have the behavioral and social science that we learn in public right. health to understand how to target programs and tailor them to communities yes. so they're more appropriate, right? Yeah. Um, so another question I have for each of you is this. Uh, most people do not intuitively understand that uh, housing is public health, jobs are public health, well-supported K-12 through public education and public higher education like we have here at Montclair State University are all public health. So we know these examples as the social determinants of health because we study them. But how do you help people understand this in your own work? Sarah. So Clara Mass Medical Center is also part of Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health and we as a larger system have the social impact projects and each facility focuses on the social determinants of health. So we're already doing it as a system from, as you mentioned before, from a healthcare perspective, the healthcare system is already thinking about those social determinants of health. So for me at Clara Mass, I'm also their social impact lead. Mm. Whereas we think about what's needed in our immediate area. So for example, Behringer High School is one of our local high schools and they have low attendance rates. And what we've learned from another high school in the same city in Newark and Westside is they need washers and dryers. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna purchase washers and dryers for their high school. And people normally think, well, how is that anything to do? It's not a cold, it's not this, it's not that. But they need to do their laundry. And if they're doing their laundry, then they're, best, they're coming to school. So we're focusing on all these different things 
as a system and in our in each facility and that's part of the practice so i mean i'm, I'm happy to work in a system that's already focusing on these things and understanding that the social determinants of health will assist in absolutely everything good point and Ade, how about for you how do you communicate this concept to people who might struggle with it well um if you think about housing for example you know when you have a landlord that is a businessman and does not care about really about the tenants because they're in the business to make money. So it's my job, you know, as a health inspector, you know, do my work of, you know, trying to follow laws, then I do advocacy work while trying to enforce the laws, mm -hmm. you know, by like, you know, if I go to someone's home, of course I'm there for, you know, maybe a lead inspection or maybe a complaint investigation, but then I start noticing different things. Okay, maybe they don't have an elevator in the um, building or the elevator is not working and it's my job to contact the construction official to say, okay, the elevator is not working in this building or when I'm in the home and I'm doing a lead investigation, I see maybe a potential for mold or or I see maybe like rodents or vermin and then I would say, okay, do you know you have rodents and vermin? Did you complain about it to the health department? Okay. The, the tenants most of the time work in a very diverse um, minority um, community, so they're usually afraid to talk to you know the authority because they feel like they might get evicted. It might be undocumented immigrants, and you know. So when I go over there and I talk about those and try to, and, and try to find a solution to their problems, maybe now I call the landlord. I say, okay, do you know you're responsible for fixing the rodent and vermin problem, how come, how come your ceiling is leaking? And when I do all these things, we don't think about it as, okay, the social determinant of health, but that everything all adds up because it might give the tenant stress on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, if I want to go to my kitchen, I cannot cook in the kitchen because I feel I'm going to see a rat then, you know, but then now you could go to the kitchen and cook. That just alleviates a lot of stress. So. It's true. It seems like we have to see through multiple pairs of eyes and hear through multiple sets of ears mm -hmm. and then speak with mul in multiple languages, right. sometimes right. literally, right? right? And how about for you, Monica? How do you convey this sense of social determinants of health to people who may not really understand it? Sure. So speaking to housing, for example, um, we, as part of the quit centers, um, some of the housing are actually not tobacco free right? And to um, have a, self, a safe uh, environment in order to live in and work in, um, we want to make sure that this is accessible to um, the patients, that the services are accessible. So for example, what we're doing now, we partnered up with the New Jersey Prevention Network. We are a treatment fo focused program. So what we do is we bring in a program that focuses on policy change. And then while we also target the treatment aspect of it, mm -hmm. giving them resources to be able to say, hey, you don't have to go tobacco free right away overnight because we know that policy change takes a long time, um, but being able to make sure that those resources are there, um, the toolkits are there for them to implement that policy mm -hmm. change, and then when they need those resources, we're there to guide them. Um, a lot of times people don't see that um, just living in some place where um, you know you have clean air to breathe um, or um, if, you know no lead, um, those things are really, really important for us, um, and to have those those policies put in place and the resources put in place is important. Um, it's oftentimes, I think, overlooked mm. a lot um, in terms of shelter because it goes back to my initial statement with basic needs. Mm -hmm. that's right. um, and, and I think that's really the important part, just making sure that everyone is aware that it is a public health concern um, because everyone should have accessibility to public needs, to basic needs. Mm -hmm. Good point. So now I want to turn from the big picture to the personal. Um, you're each public health professionals. At some point you chose to study this field and came to us to do that, and we're very happy about that. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how does public health work reflect your own beliefs and values? Sarah. Sure. So I mean, going back to the basic needs, everyone deserves dignified way of living, mm -hmm. and public health does that. And honestly, it's a true passion. Like going into this work, you need to have conviction with what you do. And it goes into your ethics. I mean, it goes down to you to your core that you practice your, your profession 
every single day and not just at work mm -hmm. but like with your friends with everyone like you are constantly aware of everything and everyone and it's a bit exhausting but I mean it's just it's part of who you are mm -hmm. and I think that for so long when you have a personality that you want to help people but you don't really know what to do I think that public health really just encompasses everything because it's broad enough that you can say, I want to focus on, just like people here at this table, you know, lead, mm -hmm. nicotine, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And it's just everything. So I think that with that, it's, it's who you are. Live, breathe it, you know. It's, really, <laughs> it's, it's much more than nine to five, isn't Correct. it? Correct, right? yes it is. And Are, how about for you, the personal connection to your beliefs and values from public health? Yeah, so, um, you know, I always grew up wanting to be a mechanical engineer. Um, but then when I was growing up, I just, little basic things like you know when I went to play soccer I never washed my hands before you know I drank water with my hands <laughs> you know and then you know but then our immune system was also very good but then yeah. my elder brother you know he passed away from typhoid fever when he was 14 and he basically he it could have probably been prevented just by simple hand washing so when I think about public health and you know, helping people when I think about like you know the social justice aspect of things. Um, you know, when I'm dealing with like maybe like a landlord and I go to court and the landlord is saying one day and I'm seeing other things. I'm very passionate mm -hmm. about that. And I try not to take things personally when you know when I'm in court, but I make sure that they, they go above and beyond to make sure that those tenants that are living there are getting some type of equity and equality mm -hmm. like everyone else so yeah. that's why I, yeah. I take that very personal. Yeah. Yeah. And Monica how about for you, The pro how does this reflect your personal f beliefs and values? Sure so I have a similar story where uh, my yeah. father yeah. he yeah. ended up um, getting yeah. sick and having several oh. strokes um, and I became one of his caregivers um, alongside with my mom and my sister of course. Um, so being able to be a caregiver for somebody does take a toll on you. You realize that also um, work, being closely, working closely with his providers, going to the doctor's office, making sure that there's medication compliance, right? Mm -hmm. That he's taking his medications, that he has um, accessibility to get to the doctor's mm -hmm. office. Um, that is all public health and I think it impacts us directly. Um, also having very close friends and family that have gone through addiction, mm -hmm. um, especially in the field that I work, Addiction is very, very um, taboo in some ways. I think now we are really breaking the stigma mm -hmm. and we are really talking about it more. Um, also in terms of nicotine, it's usually not really looked at as um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really emerging more so now, especially with the vapes. Um, so being able to make sure that um, you know the people that need that help are there. Um, public health impacts you in every way possible. Uh, it's all around you. Um, it's in your life, and sometimes you don't even realize that. Sure. Thank you for sharing those personal experiences. Um, and yet, connect the the dots to your your training, your preparation mm -hmm. here at Montclair State University in our master's uh, degree program. Um, I'm just wondering if you reflect back on the education you mm -hmm. had here, what was the most valuable skill or insight that you learned from studying public health here at Montclair State University? Sarah? My class size, my the diverse group of people in my class, mm -hmm. we had very different levels. So for me personally, I went straight through from undergrad to graduate school, and I had people who had been in their professional world for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it was I was able to learn from different people, from different, no and that was like my first exposure to networking, mm -hmm. and to be able to see that this is what other people are doing in the profession, and it's not your, your typical what I would have thought public health was. It just opened up my world to different things, and it's just that's why I chose Montclair. I was an undergrad student here as well, and I love the diversity of, and the, the community that's established, so that's truly what I love about this I place. See, yeah. 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 And Are, how about in your experience here? <laughs> well, um, it taught me a big sense of responsibility. <laughs> so, um, I have my doctors. <laughs> <laughs> um, doc, Dr. L, especially. Um, Dr. She, she, Lieberman? Yes, oh, yes Dr. Dr. Lieberman. Lieberman. Yeah, yes. Lieberman she, um, I always thought she, we had like a love-hate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> because no matter what I did, it was never enough. <laughs> you know, I had to do more. Yeah. So, and even if I, were, even, I went to work full-time and I was working here, 
you know, she, being late was not an excuse. She was, you know, she she taught me a big sense of responsibility and the world does not owe you anything and mm -hmm. you have to work hard. Sure. And um, as far as the public health aspect, you know, because I was already working in public health, I was, I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted to become a health officer. Mm -hmm. That's why I decided to come in. And when I was here, I mean, my class was full of very special individuals. I had doctors, I had people working with insurances. Mm -hmm. So like, it was just a different, you know, different perspective every time. Mm -hmm. And then, we talk about like um, the the part where we talk about health disparities and you know people like you know that don't necessarily look like me when they hear what I go through as you know an African American an African man, mm. they learn a lot from me and so maybe that will help them in their public health mm -hmm. practice. Of course, there's data to show you know the difference in um, how like you know. I, Minority groups are, might be treated from how, um, you know, the, the predominantly, you know, group is treated. And mm -hmm. so that, that, that I, I love my experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah. And how about you, Monica? So similar to Sarah, I also did my undergrad and my grad here. Um, and I absolutely love the program for so many different reasons. Um, not only exposure, but I think also the structures of the courses really prepared me um, in terms of actually being able to implement what I learned, mm -hmm. <laughs> which oftentimes you hear a lot of people, they go to school and then they graduate and then they do nothing with what they graduated mm -hmm. in. Um, complete opposite. Um, I. Uh, in my in my master's program, um, I was able to create um, a curriculum um, after I went to study abroad in Nicaragua, um, and it was for an organization who um, dealt with youth um, that had uh, you know very a lot of different disparities, and being able to develop a sex education curriculum for them. Wow. Um, so I actually translated that into my career too. So um, being able to create a curriculum for smoking cessation, um, for the tobacco treatment specialists that we work with, and really making sure that you can tailor it also mm -hmm. to uh, health literacy levels across the board. Um, so being able to also connect with different people. The connections that you make here are, you know, they're for a lifetime, honestly. Um, they've been supportive even after we graduate mm -hmm. um, from here. And um, being part of the listserv is awesome mm -hmm. because you are always getting updates about different um, conferences or different jobs or different opportunities um, just to expand. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely a, an amazing opportunity to be part of that program. When we watch our graduates go out into the world, we feel both excited uh, and happy that they're going to go make change in the world for the better, and then we feel sad when we lose them. So we're very <laughs> excited that you came back today so we thank could hear you. more about the good work you're doing. Thank you. I would like to thank all of our guests for being here to help us celebrate the 10th anniversary of Montclair State University's Master of Public Health degree program. We're looking forward to the next 10 years and beyond. As we all uh, demonstrated today, and as you demonstrated, um, public health is really the work of translating science into service. And the service you all provide to the public assures that our society will be healthier, safer, and more just. If you think there's an MPH degree in your future, or you're just interested in learning more about public health, um, find us at the following website address, montclair.edu slash graduate. Thank you very much for your time today.